Human Services, uh, the local co-chairman, and uh, this commission will be um, in our church here, in the grounds of our church next week. Um, so, when I knew that the Volokalsis will be here anyway, for sure, because he's a coach, he's a chairman. The coach chairman, then I asked him, he was very kind, he kindly accepted, I asked him, uh, I sent him an email, I asked him, Your Eminence, will, are you able to come a couple of days before the others? And uh, despite his busy schedule, his busy program, as you know, he's, uh, he gives lectures around the world, and he said yes. And he came, and he's giving a series of lectures. He, uh, yesterday in the morning, he talked about the last day, about icons. Uh, later in the evening at uh, Kanishis College. Uh, this uh, morning, uh, uh, also this afternoon, uh, rather, he talked to the Roman Catholic, St. Joseph University Roman Catholic Church about the Roman Catholic and Orthodox Dialogue. And tonight and tomorrow, he will be here. Uh, tonight is a little bit different, your Eminence. Uh, you are in familiar ground, you are in one in an orthodox ground. <laughs> the other talks were in, uh, in uh, university colleges and in the Catholic Church. Now we are in our ground, we are in an orthodox ground. And uh, tonight I don't have to say much to these people who are going to introduce you, because everybody knows who the important God is. Uh, you see them, they hold your books, they listen to tapes and uh, DVDs and uh, CDs of your lectures, and they know you. And we're very blessed and honored to talk to the Golden Cows with us tonight. I, I know the Golden Cows because from the time I was a priest in London, in England, uh, he had come in my parish to give a lectures. Then he came again later in Ohio, in my next parish in America. Now he's coming to this parish. You've been to all three of my parishes. <laughs> uh, St. Dimitrios in uh, Edmonton, in North London, St. Scott in Hell, Middleton, Ohio, and here in uh, Annunciation in Buffalo. So uh, we're very honored and very blessed uh, to have you with us and the whole of your eminence. Thank you for coming. My subject tonight, friends, is the place of the Jesus prayer in our Orthodox spirituality. Lord, teach us to pray, the disciples say to Christ. How are we to learn to pray? Not just in the sense of repeating prayers from the words from books, but by offering living prayer, inner prayer, prayer of creative silence, prayer of the heart. Let me start with a definition of prayer. And this is taken from a 19th century Russian spiritual master, Saint Theophan the recluse. He says, the principal thing is to stand before God with the mind in the heart and to go on standing before him unceasingly, day and night, until the end of life. We notice three things here. First, to pray is to stand before God. It is not necessary always to be asking for things. It is not necessary always to be using words. The deepest prayer is simply to wait on God. I remember a story told by a preacher when I heard when I was a boy, about 11 or 12 years old. 
If you preach sermons and children are present, be careful what you say, for children sometimes listen very carefully to sermons. <laughs> At any rate, I remember what was said in that sermon in my early years. The preacher told a story about an old man. I think this story is taken from the life of the Curie Dahl, but the preacher didn't mention that. Once upon a time, uh, there was an old man who spent a long time each day in church. And people asked him, what are you doing there? I'm praying, he said. Praying, they answered. That means you must have a very great many things to ask from God if you spend such a long time there. And he replied, I'm not asking God for anything. Well, they said, what are you doing there? Pray. And he answered, I just sit and look at God and God sits and looks at me. <laughs> when I was 11 years old, I thought that was a very good definition of prayer, <laughs> and I still think so. Prayer is not a request, but a relationship. So to pray is to stand before God, or if you like, sit before God, as the old man did. And then St. Theophan says a second thing. To pray is to stand with the mind in the heart. Now here he has in view the three levels of prayer that are often mentioned in texts both Eastern and Western. You have the first of all prayer of the lips oral prayer. And then you have prayer of the mind, the beginning of inner prayer. And thirdly, you have prayer of the heart, the fulfillment of inner prayer. Heart here signifies not just the affections or emotions, in scripture and in the orthodox tradition, the heart signifies the deep self, the inner shrine, the spiritual center of the whole human person. To enter the heart, to discover the place of the heart, that means a total reintegration of the human person. The heart is open below to the abyss of the unconscious, and above it's open to the abyss of divine love. So prayer of the heart means prayer of the whole person. Prayer of Christ and the Holy Spirit within me. As St. Paul says, not I but Christ in me. Galatians 2.20 So, Theophan urges us to pray with the mind in the heart, to unite our mind, our conscious thoughts, with the heart the center of the total person. And then he says, thirdly, that we are to pray is to stand unceasingly, day and night, until the end of life. Here he has in mind the words of St. Paul that are so often quoted in Eastern Christian texts. Pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 
5.17. And for the importance of this text, you're going to read the Philokalia and indeed the book known as the Way of a Pilgrim, or the Pilgrim's Tale. Pray without ceasing. Prayer is to be not merely one activity among others. It is to be the activity of our whole life. It is to be a dimension that enters into everything that we do. Indeed, uh, prayer is to be not simply something that we do, but rather something that we are. <coughs> St. Isaac the Syrian says that even when asleep, the saints do not cease to pray, because the Holy Spirit is always praying within them. So when I see my audience dropping off to sleep, I can reflect that they are praying. <laughs> As I mentioned in one of my earlier talks here in Buffalo, there was one occasion when I went to sleep in my own talk. <laughs> I was unwise enough to be talking sitting down. <laughs> and as I continued, I grew more and more sleepy. And as I dropped off, I could hear a voice droning on. <laughs> and suddenly I realized that it was my own voice. <laughs> and I had no idea what I was saying. <laughs> so, yes, this is what the world needs. Not just people who say prayers from time to time, but people who are prayer all the time, the living flame of prayer. But how are we to attain such prayer? How are we to begin? And there are many possible ways of entry. But I wish to speak to you this evening about one such possibility, very much loved and honored in the Orthodox tradition, and that is the Jesus Prayer. But I do not say it is the only way. I do not say it is the best way. I say merely, it has helped me, perhaps it will help you also. What then do I mean by the Jesus Prayer? It is a short invocation frequently repeated. What St. Augustine calls an arrow prayer. He says the Desert Fathers use very short prayers frequently repeated, shot up into heaven, like an arrow. In its usual form, the Jesus prayer runs, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. In Greek, Kyrie Isu Christe, Iethe Uele Sonme. In Slavonic, Gospodi Isu Se Christe, Sine Borja Pomiluimia. So in English it's ten words, in Greek and Slavonic it's only seven words, <laughs> but in Greek and Slavonic the words are longer. <laughs> so we have about the equal number of syllables in both. But in fact, there is variety within the path of the Jesus prayer. And alongside this, which I might call the standard form, you can have many variations. Sometimes you may say, have mercy on me, the sinner, making it more penitential. Or you might say, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us, in the plural. 
bringing others into the prayer in an explicit way. And that is in fact the form that I use. Or you can make it uh, shorter. You can say, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, leaving out Son of God. Or you might just say, Lord Jesus, have mercy. Occasionally, but not frequently in the Orthodox tradition, you find the practice of saying the name Jesus just on its own. That was common in the West during the Middle Ages, just to say Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. But in Orthodoxy, though you find this occasionally, it's not the normal way of saying the Jesus prayer. There is a feeling that the holy name of Jesus is too powerful to be said on its own. It needs to be, as it were, diluted with other words. But underneath all the variations of the Jesus prayer, there is, as the heart of the prayer, the holy name Jesus itself. And this name is felt to be a source of grace, almost a sacrament. So the Jesus prayer is not just a rhythmic mantra, not just a technique to produce concentration or relaxation. The Jesus prayer is an invocation. It is words addressed to a specific person, to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that distinguishes the Jesus prayer from similar methods of praying in yoga or Zen. For example, a good many years ago, very popular in America, found also in England, there was the movement of transcendental meditation. And in this transcendental meditation, each person was given by his guru, his spiritual teacher, a particular set of syllables to repeat over and over again. And these syllables were not supposed to have any particular meaning. In fact, very often they were the names of lesser gods and goddesses in the uh, Hindu pantheon, which raises the difficult question whether Christians should pray invoking Hindu gods and goddesses but I leave that on one side. The point I wish to make is that unlike transcendental meditation, the Jesus prayer is not just rhythmic syllables, but it has a specific meaning. It is a particular invocation, and it is addressed specifically to Jesus as Son of God and Savior a personal invocation with a particular content. Now let's think a little bit more about the meaning of the Jesus Prayer. The Jesus Prayer, it is said in the way of a pilgrim, contains the whole of the Gospel. And we can see this in several ways. First of all, within the Jesus Prayer, there is a movement of ascent and return. We go up to God, we ascend, as we say, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God. We ascend in adoration. And then we return to ourselves in penitence when we say, on me a sinner. And what bridges the gulf between God's glory 
and my sin is the word mercy. Have mercy. Now, people often misunderstand this word mercy, eleos in Greek. They think that it is a somber word that we are pleading with God, that we are abasing ourselves. That is not the full meaning of mercy. Sometimes the Greek fathers link eleos, mercy, with the word eleon, meaning olive oil. That is in fact a bad etymology, but it's good theology. <laughs> Mercy means the love of God poured out like oil to heal and to reconcile. Looking at the Jesus prayer from another point of view, we can say it is a Trinitarian prayer. Christ is invoked as Son and therefore we think immediately of God the Father. But the prayer is also offered in the Holy Spirit. One of the texts which writers on the Jesus Prayer use very frequently is 1 Corinthians 12, 3. No one can say Lord Jesus except in the Holy Spirit. So the Spirit is present in the Jesus Prayer, even though he is not named. He is, as it were, the atmosphere in which the Jesus Prayer is said. And the Jesus Prayer, again, looking at it from another viewpoint, is a Christ-centered prayer, emphasizing the two natures of Christ. When we say Lord and Son of God, we think of his divinity. When we say Jesus, we think of his humanity. Because Jesus is the name that was given to the second person of the Trinity at his human birth by his mother. The angel says to Joseph, you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. So Jesus means God incarnate who is our Savior. The Jesus Prayer is in this way a confession of faith in Jesus Christ as Son of God and Savior. So, yes, our Lord warns us against vain repetitions. But the Jesus Prayer is not a vain repetition if it is said with living faith in the person of Jesus the Savior. Now, how do we use the Jesus Prayer? There are two situations which we may call free and fixed. Free. First of all, we can say the Jesus Prayer once or many times in all the moments of the day that might otherwise be wasted. We can use it at the first moment when we wake up. Instead of thinking, oh, another day, and I've got so many disagreeable things to do. <laughs> begin the day by recalling the presence of Christ with you. Begin the day by praying for Jesus' prayer. And then you can use it when you are carrying out all kinds of mechanical tasks, such as washing up the dishes, or walking from one place to another, 
If you drive a car when you're stuck in a traffic jam, if you travel by public transport as I do, you can use it while you're waiting for the bus. The Oxford bus system where I live leaves many opportunities for <laughs> You can use it inwardly, not speaking aloud. When you are interviewing people, when you are counselling them, so often when we're talking, we find the conversation doesn't rise to the true level of meaning. If you will pause for a moment, say the Jesus prayer two or three times, you'll find that it changes the conversation and somehow a new spirit enters into it. You can use the Jesus prayer at moments of temptation, for example, when you feel anger rising within you. I find the Jesus prayer is very useful at committee meetings. <laughs> <laughs> so the aim here in the free use of the Jesus Prayer is to unite work time and prayer time, to bring prayer into our daily work, to turn the work itself into prayer. In the words of St. Theophan, the hands at work, the mind and heart with God. So, part of the purpose of the Jesus Prayer and its free use is to bring God into all aspects of our daily life. To bring Him into everything. To make the secular sacred. In the words of Father Alexander Schmemann, the Christian is the one who, wherever he or she looks, sees everywhere Christ and rejoices in Him. See Christ everywhere. That will be one of the effects of the free use of the Jesus Prayer. As is said in one of the sayings attributed to Christ, Lift the stone and you will find me. Cut the wood in two and there am I. The Jesus Prayer can enable us in this way to find Christ everywhere, in all things and in all per persons. But then we have the fixed use of the Jesus Prayer, by which I mean that we recite the prayer under conditions of outward quiet with fully gathered attentiveness. Usually, Orthodox say the Jesus Prayer sitting, sitting on a chair with a back like these chairs, but probably without arms. You don't want to make yourself too comfortable in an armchair when you're praying, you need perhaps to sit upright. In the tradition of Mount Athos, the monks recite the Jesus Prayer on a low stool, about ten inches high, and they recite it in a crouching position, which rapidly becomes highly uncomfortable. <laughs> but I would suggest to people at any rate, when beginning the Jesus Prayer, that they should sit upright on a chair with a back, with their own back straight. The aim would be to be as little conscious of your body as possible, not to fidget. Usually then, the Jesus Prayer is said seated, you could say it's standing, you could say it's lying down, but the there's an obvious danger there. <laughs> I remember once when I was in the monastery that I belonged to, the monastery of Patmos, 
it was during Lent and it was cold and the morning service had long portions of the Psalms. The whole Psalter in Lent during the Orthodox monastic services is recited twice every week and that means about 40 minutes of the Psalms being read and they were read in the monastery by somebody in a monotone very quickly and I couldn't follow them. So I thought to myself, well, um, I'm not gaining anything by sitting here in church. I will go to my room and say the Jesus prayer there. And when I got to my room, I thought it's rather cold, so I turned on the electric fire. We haven't got any central heating in the monastery. And my electric fire was of an antique design. And then I thought to myself, well, I could say the Jesus Prayer lying down, <laughs> and I did so. But there was a startling sequel. As soon as I lay down, there was a brilliant green flash, and my antique electric fire exploded. <laughs> Not only did it do that, but it fused all the lights in the monastery. <laughs> so I thought after that, I had to live without any heating at all in the cold Lent days and nights. And I concluded, well, I should stay in church. <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> yes. So, usually the Jesus Prayer is said seated with the eyes closed, perhaps in a darkened room. Usually when we're saying it in this fixed way, we say it alone. It is said, not chanted. We can say it aloud, but very often we may prefer just to articulate the words within us secretly. And to help us when reciting the Jesus Prayer, we have the use of a prayer rope. Here is an example, knotted wool or cord, and you say one Jesus Prayer on each knot. And the purpose uh, it's not necessary to count the number of times we say the Jesus Prayer. That is not important. As Sudais of the Syrian says, I do not wish to count milestones, but to enter the kingdom. But using a prayer rope of this kind, moving the beads or knots, through our fingers, that helps us to concentrate. It helps us to keep up a regular rhythm of the prayer. The prayer, we are told, in the words of Staritz Patheny of Kiev, should be like a gently flowing stream. And the Jesus prayer may help us. The use of a prayer rope may help us to do that. The prayer rope is known in Greek as Komboskinion, and we should not confuse it with worry beads, Komvologion, <laughs> worry beads that you see Greek men playing with in their hands. Those are not quite the same as a prayer word. <laughs> I recall a rather idealistic English convert going to Greece, and when he came back, he said, Greece is a wonderful country. Well, so it is. Uh, but, he said, the people are so spiritual. <laughs> Why? Even in the restaurants, the men who are smoking, drinking ouzo, and uh, playing cards, all the time, they are saying the Jesus Christ. <laughs> he had confused the worry beads with the prayer rope. 
Another external aid when saying the Jesus Prayer is the control of the breathing. Uh, this was developed particularly in the 13th and 14th century in Byzantium. And the technique, psychophysical technique used with the Jesus Prayer had three features. The first was to sit in a particular posture, as I mentioned, on a low stool, with your head bowed, resting on your chest. The second feature of the physical method was to link the rhythm of the prayer with the rhythm of the breathing. The simplest way of doing that is to say the first part of the prayer as you breathe in, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, and the second half of the prayer as you breathe out, have mercy on me, a sinner. And accompanying the regular recitation of the prayer coordinated with the rhythm of the breathing, there was thirdly a practice of inner exploration of concentrating on particular psychosomatic centers, first on the head, then on the breathing passing down through the lungs, and finally on the heart. Now, this technique, in an interesting way, has parallels with methods of prayer in Indian yoga, and in the Persian Sufis. That has interested many people. There was a rash of articles back in the middle of the last century about Byzantine yogis and the like. But the parallels with methods of prayer in uh, Hinduism or Islam should not blind us to the fact that what matters in the Jesus Prayer is not the outward technique, but the inward invocation. What matters is not just how we pray, but to whom. And in the Jesus Prayer, we are praying quite specifically to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And that distinguishes the Jesus Prayer from parallel methods in other religions. But there may have been some mutual influence during the Byzantine period between the Sufis and the Byzantine Hesychasts. Now, we are warned to be very cautious about using the physical method, and in particular, not to employ the techniques of inner exploration unless we have the guidance of an experienced spiritual father. <clears throat> Personally, I don't think there is any danger in using a very simple breathing technique. As I said just now, breathing in on the first part of the prayer, breathing out of the second part. But if we want to go further than that in the use of these physical techniques, which are not described in detail in the books, then we need to have a teacher, and particularly if we're going to practice the inner exploration that I mentioned in outline. But it is not always easy to find a spiritual father or mother. Some people say you shouldn't use the Jesus Prayer unless you have direct guidance. I would say even if you have not got the guidance of a spiritual teacher who watches over you personally, you can still say the Jesus Prayer without any danger in a simple form, even using a simple coordination with the breathing, such as I have outlined. But to go further than that, it's advisable to have a teacher who will understand 
the path we are following. Probably we should not say the Jesus prayer at the beginning for very long periods. Fifteen minutes, morning and evening, that could be quite enough when starting. You do not want to use the Jesus prayer or any technique of praying as a way of forcing things, as a way of making us have particular spiritual experiences. We must say the prayer simply not demanding any particular result apart from the conscious and loving attention to God. Yes, the Jesus prayer does indeed lead by God's grace to the vision of uncreated light, the light of Christ's transfiguration, not a created physical light, but the light of the eternal uncreated energies of God. But it is better not to speak too much about this. So then, the fruit of the Jesus prayer, as of all prayer, is to make us a man or woman for others. Some people say, is it not selfish to shut yourself up alone in the dark and to keep saying, have mercy on me, a sinner? Are you not turning your back on the suffering of the world around you. To this my answer would be that if we say the Jesus Prayer, if only for ten minutes each day, that will make us during all the other minutes and hours of the day more useful to others, more at their disposal. Saint Seraphim Musarov said, Acquire inner peace, and thousands round you will find their salvation. If we have inner peace, then our preaching will become words of fire, and our social action will bring genuine hope and healing to others. If we don't have inner peace, it's unlikely we shall be able to help others or to have any positive effect. Because we have prayed alone, even for 10 or 15 minutes of the day, we shall be more available to others, more loving, more Christ-like. In this way, the Jesus Prayer, so far from being selfish, will be a creative source of life to those around us. Thank you. essential part of the Jesus prayer. So we can recite the Jesus prayer in a simple way without any physical technique at all apart from love of God. That's perfectly possible. These techniques are optional 
They may help some people, but they are not obligatory on everyone. So, yes, it is very important to distinguish between the outward aids and techniques and the inner essence of the prayer. And the inner essence of the prayer is quite simply to invoke Jesus conscious of his immediate presence. No other technique is necessary, but I mentioned the techniques because they are often referred to in the sources. But they have a secondary place and are not essential. Yes, please. Um, you mentioned about the Jesus prayer not being, I shouldn't say it, demanding, but I find myself like during the day being vexed by sources around me, anger, and then, you know, to calm myself, I would say the Jesus prayer. But I guess in retrospect, I guess it really didn't really work. So I don't you know, when should, <laughs> is, it, is it a right to say it, you know, when you're trying to get that inner peace? into you or, you know, the presence of Jesus to handle a situation? There is no harm at all in saying the Jesus prayer when we are at moments of stress or anger or something has happened which causes us great unhappiness. Certainly we may say the Jesus prayer as a way of quieting and calming ourselves. But it should never be simply a technique for getting calm, but it should always be words of prayer, as I emphasized, words of prayer addressed to Jesus. In other words, yes, the Jesus prayer can have many useful and helpful effects when we are in situations of pressure and distress. And we may use it to help us, but we never see it simply as an end in itself to calm us. We always see it as a way of reaching out to Christ. But, for example, if we are very upset because the bus doesn't come and we've got an appointment the other end, then certainly instead of saying, when is this bus going to come? Why? It's late. It should have come 10 minutes ago, which is a sheer waste of spiritual energy because it won't make the bus come one second earlier. <laughs> Why not uh, say the Jesus prayer? And this may help to calm us. And we are not abusing the prayer if we use it in this way to help us. But always we remember it's not just a method of relaxation, but it is a prayer. <coughs> Some people use the Jesus prayer, for example, uh, before, when they can't sleep at night. Though somebody else said to me the other day, that they find the Jesus prayer far too exciting and it makes them all more awake. But, uh, I find that it does help me to sleep. And again, that's not a misuse of the prayer as long as we do not think that it's simply a substitute for a sleeping pill. As long as we bear in mind to whom we are speaking. Now, Yes. The audience, um, many of the prayer ropes um, will have smaller or larger beads in between the, t the 11 uh, large beads for prayers, I've been told, in Theotokos, also the Theotokos says. Is that appropriate that Theotokos should be involved during the process of the Jesus prayer? There are some ways of doing that. Um, first of all, yes, you will find that uh, different prayer ropes are arranged in different ways. Very often you will find the uh, knots are in sequences of ten, and in between there's a slightly larger knot or a bead. 
Now that would be useful for a slightly different uh, purpose that sometimes in the uh, services you are supposed to say Kyrie uh, eleison, Lord have mercy, 40 times. And if you have a prayer rope, that helps you to count. But that's a quite different use of the prayer rope. You can bring the Mother of God into the prayer. Um, I do know uh, some people who say, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, at the prayers of the Theotokos, have mercy on me. That makes it rather long, but that certainly is a practice followed in some places. Um, you can intersperse the saying of the Jesus prayer. Perhaps after you've said it a hundred times, you can then say, uh, Most Holy Mother of God, save me uh, ten times, and then go back to the Jesus prayer. So there are different ways of bringing in the invocation of the Mother of God, different ways of using the prayer rope. I use it in a perfectly simple way just for saying the Jesus prayer on its own. And we are advised not to keep changing the words of prayer. Uh, part of the value of the Jesus prayer is that we are using the same words, though not mechanically, but by using the same words, we gather our attention more closely into the prayer. If we keep varying the forms of words that we are using, that may serve as a distraction. We want to keep the Jesus prayer simple, not to make it too complicated. Yes, you had a question. No, you didn't raise your hand. I thought you did. Yes. I was fascinated by your definition of mercy. And I was hoping you could elaborate a little bit on that and also speak about mercy in the context of salvation. Yes. Mercy is, of course, a many-sided word. We can think of it, first of all, as the mercy of God towards us. But then we think of it also as the mercy that we are called to show to other persons. So it has, as it were, a horizontal aspect of mercy of God flowing down upon us, and a, a, it has a vertical aspect of mercy of God flowing down upon us, and then a horizontal aspect, ourselves showing mercy to others. We pass on what we have received. But I would see mercy as being fundamentally love in action. So it is God's love towards us. And when we say, Lord, have mercy, we are opening our hearts to receive that love. And then it is also the love that we show in God's name towards others. And so mercy goes closely with service to others. Because we are not required only to have nice feelings towards others, we are invited to do something about it. And so I see mercy as closely linked with action, with service. Does that help a little? Very much, thank you. Good, yes. So now, other questions? Well, if there are no more questions, we can come to an end. Yes. Thank you, Reverend. Uh, I want to remind you the next opportunity that we have this week uh, to hear His Eminence. Tomorrow morning, exactly this 